Hedge fund billionaire Ray Dalio has said that China could be the world's next great superpower. On this show, Peter Zion has said to me that China is probably on the brink of catastrophe. Where do you see China's economy in the near future? If China is to become that great economic power that everyone for a generation now has been saying is kind of inevitable, it has got so many barriers and so many hurdles it's got to get over between now and then that, frankly, it kind of is looking increasingly unlikely. Um, you know, the big ones, you know, are, are you know, unquestionably the demographic cliff that China is facing. So it's, uh, you know, its population is ra- is aging rapidly. The percentage of uh, retirees is increasing aggressively. Hence, the, you know, the balance between people in the workforce and the people who are retired and relying on people in the work, a smaller number of people in the workforce to, to generate economic growth. That imbalance is going to get bigger and bigger. And then on top of that, the absolute size of China's population is going to start shrinking aggressively. Um, you know, it, it's already shrinking and it's just going to become more and more aggressive in its decline throughout the rest of, of, of the century. So that's the first big issue. The second issue is, you know, China has already accumulated huge amounts of debt to drive its economic model over the past 20 years, and it's trying to work through that at the moment. Um, and so, you know, that that as well is kind of presenting a, a headwind to its sort of economic its economic fortunes. On top of that, you've kind of got the the economic challenges it's facing because the United States is no longer willing to uh, sort of perpetuate the the economic relationship which has kind of been foundational to China's economic rise over the past thirty years. So all of that stands in the way of of China sort of the, the inevitability of China, something that I think you know, was broadly anticipated China would inevitably become a, a larger economy than that of the United States. It would inevitably become a great power in its own right. And because of those barriers, those things are not necessarily going to, to occur. I think realistically, um, you know, China's strength has always been premised on its ability to be able to grow quickly um, and for its economic growth rate to remain at a, a fairly aggressive level relative to, to other economies. Now, we're at the point now where that no longer looks to be the case. It seems feasible that in the near future, China will be growing over the long term at 2%, 3%, maybe even longer. And that then raises the, it may be even lower, pardon me. So that then raises the question, you know, a China that is growing at, you know, economic at, at, at rates which are comparable, maybe marginally faster, maybe marginally slower than major uh, you know, major developed economies, does that translate, allow it to translate into a greater power status? And I think that is the real challenge. I mean, if it is only growing at, at 2% or 3%, does that allow it to you know, challenge the United States for great power status? Does that allow it to, to you know, to achieve that inevitability that we assumed that it, it, it was kind of baked into the cake? And I think increasingly it's looking like, look, you know, it's looking as though that is not going to be the case. If it's not the case, what comes next? Would we see a, a descent for China or, or would it be a, a maintenance sort of period? I think we're, we're entering into a, peri- a period of time, not just for China, but for many countries around the world, where it's difficult to say exactly what comes next, because we've never really been in this position where populations are, are, are sort of starting to shrink fairly aggressively. I mean, you know, our entire model of economic growth for however long it's been has been premised on the on the idea of, of growth. Um, and you know, that that the part and parcel of that is the populations kind of get bigger year on year, even if it's only by marginal amounts. And all of a sudden, China's population is going to decline aggressively. So, what does that mean for the political system? What does it mean for its aspirations? What does it mean for the way it engages with its neighbours? And all of that is an open question at the moment. Um, but you know, in terms of the sort of signals that come out of, of China at the moment, it is certainly aware of some, its vulnerabilities. It talks a lot about the need to uh, ensure security of supply. It talks about the need to, you know, stimulate domestic demand and more equitably distribute wealth domestically because it realises that its economic model up until this point is not sustainable. There is this real understanding in the system 
that things have to change. But even though there is that understanding and there's a whole lot of talk about how things have to change, it's difficult to say how that will necessarily connect and interact with the reality of, say, you know, uh, you know radically slowing populations and a, and a global trade regime that is, is kind of shifting beneath its feet as the United States takes you know, it takes on a new direction or takes on a, uh, you know, starts is sort of changing the rules of, of, of global trade based on what it perceives as, as sort of new geopolitical realities. Mm -hmm. So what can be done on the part of China to to address this and to to put up their best um, fight in the world? I'm not sure necessarily what can be done. I mean, from where I sit, the most interesting thing is just kind of looking at what they are doing. Mm. So I think I found fascinating was in 2020 when Xi Jinping rolled out his his vision of common prosperity. Now, it's taken a little bit of a backseat over the last couple of years because of COVID, um, because China remains very much con committed to this uh, what they call dynamic clearing or what the rest of the world calls their zero COVID policy, whereby, you know, if you know enough cases of localized COVID's pops up then the, you know, the entire city or the entire district gets shut down in order to keep keep a lock on this now that's had a huge impact on both economic growth and its ability to kind of roll out or cultivate or p p kind of pursue uh this sort of new way economic this vision of, of common prosperity uh but nonetheless i mean we, we saw it even with xi jinping's report his speech over the weekend at the 20th party congress i mean it was riddled throughout all these comments that pertain to the economy were very much informed by this vision of common prosperity, which at its heart is about redistributing the way that wealth is allocated in the Chinese economy. Um, but it's not just that. It's not about just taking from the haves and giving to the have-nots. It's very much tied up with this idea of like, hey, China's economy cannot continue to grow in the way that it has traditionally continued to grow, which has been debt-led in, um, investment in public works and housing that is no longer sustainable. The way China has to grow in the future is by consuming more domestically. Because even that this export machine, that, that model of growth, that went out the window decades ago, but you know it's had a bit of a resurgence during COVID. Even that's not going to work anymore because the rest of the world cannot absorb um, you know, increasing exports from China because China's just too big. So there needs to be China needs to grow in the way that the rest of the world grows, and that is it needs to consume more domestically. And that's sort of tied up into this idea of common prosperity as well, that it's not just a question of growing up the pie anymore, but the the way that the pie is allocated has to be changed. And so resources, it's not just going from the haves to the have-nots, it's about taking them from the state sector, from the local governments who have a monopoly over the, the ownership of land and of natural resources and reallocating them to the private sector. And so doing the same thing with the state firms, which have access to, you know, subsidised uh, or, or cheap credit, low relatively low interest rate loans, uh, very cheap access to, to land, effective monopoly uh, control or influence over second, certain industries and changing the way the system works such that some of those privileges which allow them to accumulate work wealth are either broken down or the wealth itself is redistributed to to the public and only that way will people be able to acquire a bigger part of the, the part of the pie i think it's also fascinating as well because there's been particularly outside of china there's been this sort of you know one of the ways that we typically have perceived china's crackdown on the tech sector over the last couple of years is that it is really this is really it's an anti-private sector movement right that what we've seen is that xi jinping has shown his, his real colors and that he's um you know trying to to weaken the private sector it's a little bit more complicated than that i think what we've really seen with the with the the tech sector is it's been a pushback against uh private sector when it gets too big i think it's been a, a pushback against the private sector when it no longer serves the state's interest but at the same time, when it comes to small private sector firms, the government keeps talking about just how important they are to its vision of long term prosperity. And so you kind of have this dividing line between the, the state or the party saying, yeah, we're not particularly in favour of large private sector firms because we lose control. They do things that we don't think are in the national interest. Um, they exploit 
the, 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 the effective monopoly that they've, they've, they have over the industries that they've built up. But small private sector firms, on the other hand, they are innovative. They are the ones who are responsible for driving employment in urban areas. They are the ones that um, generate economic growth and specifically household wealth. And so you read this stuff about common prosperity and it's like we need to be able to give small firms and entrepreneurs the the opportunity to succeed and to generate their own wealth so there's some really interesting ideas that that, that sort of the, the chinese state and the party are talking about like this is how our future kind of looks like in the future you know, how how we sort of perpetuate the you know the the expanding of the economic pie and the its reallocation into the future but the, the question is, of course, are they able to do it? And the, there's a couple of reasons why that will be difficult. And of course, the first is COVID, because a lot of this stuff feels like it's been pushed to the back seat until the economy is back on its feet again. And the second thing is, is vested interests. I mean, nobody wants to give up their wealth and no one wants to give up their privileges. And I think a great example um, is, uh, you know, one of the reasons one of the ways that the the state has been trying to support small private sector firms during covid is like well you know a lot of small firms their landlords are large state-owned enterprises because state-owned firms regardless of what industry they are in have managed to accumulate huge amounts of land um and so those state-owned firms have been told to give private companies uh rent holidays or at least to cut their rent significantly for you know, however many months into the future, but you know the 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 state regulator for state-owned enterprises just came out last week and said, look, a lot of you aren't doing it. <laughs> you know, we told you at the beginning of the year this has to happen, but you're not cutting rents and you're not doing it aggressively enough. It's one of those things that would be just such an easy way to provide support for for private the private private sector during this period of COVID, um, and also a great way to reallocate wealth in the system. And yet vested interests, it's just it's just too easy for them to push back and not to do it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of one of the things that I'm I'm, I'm sort of interested in looking at. There is a real sense that this, the way that the economy works, the way the system operates and the way that wealth is allocated throughout that system has to change. But I think it's going to be slow going and there is going to be potential pushback in the system against it, it happening. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching that video. To see the full episode, check out the box over here or the link in the description.